3, 2, 1, roll the footage! Welcome back everybody, I'm Simon Severino, your host, and my guest today is a fractional CSO. He has been helping PE and VC baked firms in the technology sector develop and carry out successful merger and integration strategies for 29 years. His passion and purpose are assisting clients in evolving their core business practices to realize the optimum benefit to create the most profitable exit strategies. We will talk about exit strategies and how you can raise investments right now and the role of marketing and sales in all of this. Welcome everybody, Dudley Peacock. That's a fantastic introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being uh, for allowing me on your show. Uh, fantastic show. I've listened to a number of your podcasts already. So thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, so um, Dudley, yeah, what's what is, a um, fractional CSO? Yes. What is a fractional CSO? So fractional is is really just it's a term that that uh, came. Uh, I would imagine if you think of, of the word fraction when when you were at school, it's a portion of so so a portion of my week goes towards different different clients. So I would have multiple clients, probably three, four, five, six clients at a time, and a portion of my week goes to the uh, to to those clients. So fractional being a portion of and a CSO being a chief strategy officer. Sometimes I can get confused between a chief sales officer or a um, a, a marketing or sales kind of person, but this is more to do with strategy and and the strategic direction of companies and the strategic planning. So fractional means part time or outsourced, and being the strategic advisor for companies. All right, and so who is who is calling you? People who want to raise money, people who are buying competitors and want to merge them. Who who calls you? So it's 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 a range of different people. So we have the the professional investors, which are the private equity firms, uh, investment bankers, even even lawyers that have clients that are looking to buy other businesses for strategic purposes. So often it's more difficult to generate new uh, or growth in your business by simply trying to sell more by doing more sales and, and, and marketing and spending a bigger portion of your budget in marketing and sales. So the easier way, and not that it's easy, is to buy other businesses and to buy other businesses to grow your revenue. So you could literally double your revenue by buying a business the same size as yours uh, uh, in terms of income, and you can have double the size, and you could probably pull off a transaction like that in three to 12 months. So many of the businesses that or entities that come to us are in the business of buying other businesses like uh, private equity firms or, or even corporate entities looking to expand or, or get additional um, customers or additional technology, uh, geographic regions, that sort of thing. Or it's, or it's individuals that are looking to start out and uh, have no business they're looking to buy a business and they and, and they don't know where to start. And and often um, the easier way to get into business is to buy an existing business. So we I'm often approached by people who have got some money or got access to capital, and then they go out and they and they would buy an entity. What are good businesses to buy right now? Everyone's into tech. Uh, it's quite crazy. It's um Tech seems to be the the, the way, and, and 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 tech and technology uh, has got so many definitions at the moment. Uh, you get businesses that are the old brick and mortar style businesses that are, let's say, an engineering firm that's managing to turn their business into technology based businesses. In other words, you're getting machines that and robotics and things that can operate themselves, and then you can go all the way into sort of tech um, built. Uh, businesses like fintech or sort of these banking apps and and all these applications that are, are pure software so from accounting and bookkeeping through to your e-commerce software and all that um, that's the rage at the moment um you know the the investment and and uh, and the kind of businesses that that that, that are out there to buy 
Um, I would say if you are looking for a good business, it would be one that's been uh, uh, up and running for at least five years. It's got track record. It's got a decent customer base. And uh, most of the time, the business will be in, have good cash flow, um, but potentially the the seller is a bit distressed. So they're a bit, they're at a particular point in their lives. They're wanting to retire. They have got ill health or there's some uh, life change. So those are generally the best businesses to buy. The ones with a bit of track record, ones with cash flow, with a positive cash flow that is, and um, and and ones with a, with a seller who's willing and, 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 and really keen to sell his business. Now, the, the Sprint team does a lot of post-merger integrations. So my question is, what if I buy a business and I could theoretically now have double the revenue, but what do I need to do in terms of integration so that I really get double, double the profit out of it? Hmm. Well, that's, that's the, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, because it's one thing to go out and, and, and find yourself a business to add onto an existing business. But part of the decision making that, that has to happen is, is how much of an integration am I going to do? Am I going to do a, a total integration? In other words, I'm taking over the brand, the name, uh, all the employees, the products, the services, the um, supplier contracts, the premises and all that. Am I, is that entity I'm buying, is that going to disappear completely? Or am I going to do a sort of what a very shallow type of integration? In other words, all I'm going to do is the business, will, the one I'm buying will carry on by itself without me even having to, to continue um, uh, or change much. I could, I could maybe change some of the back end uh, processes like the invoicing and, and some of the salary payments and so on, but everything else can stay separate. So one of the first things you've got to decide is how deep that integration must be. Is it a complete? Is it sort of somewhere in the middle or is it a shallow integration? And then the million dollar question then is, is how do I extract the most value? And when you're buying a business similar to yours, many times it's, an, it's the addition of customers, putting them together. But if it's a business that's say up and down the supply chain, maybe it's a supplier of yours that you're buying. So now you're buying the supply chain and now you're not only running a business that's supplying you, but you're also running the business that's making the sales. So that could also be what we call a, a, a basically a, a supply chain type of acquisition. And then you can integrate along that. And then you've got to decide at what level do you want to bring the two businesses together. Sometimes it makes sense, other times it doesn't. But the, the, the probably the most common part of integration is financial. That's bringing accounting and, and business management software systems together into one so that you can better manage the cash flow, the people, the payments, and so on. But when it comes to marketing, sometimes you want to do upsells and cross-sells with all the additional products and services that you've got. And now you have some things double, like double the HR departments, double the marketing departments, etc. So I'm really curious, how do you handle that? And what's the process um, there after one word from our sponsors? What if your business would run well even when you are on vacation? Discover how 1,600 business owners have regained their freedom using the Strategy Sprint's blueprints. How they enjoy living their dream and watching their business scale. Get the exact checklists they use to go from stressed to fulfilled using the Strategy Sprint's method. Order your copy of Strategy Sprints 12 Ways to Accelerate Growth for an Agile Business on Amazon today. And if you love it, leave us a review. For more information, head over to strategysprints.com. So we have now twice the operations team, twice the marketing team, everything double. What's the process of sorting that out? Well... Uh, it's 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 going to be something not, nobody really expects, and that is to is to listen and to understand. So, one of the biggest dangers we have when buying a business is is uh, the people. So when you when you're getting involved in another business, there's a culture difference. Often, it might be exactly the same type of business, but there's always a difference in 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 culture. So. 
one of the first things to bring them together would be to understand who the people are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, where, where they want to go and what they, where they are and within their careers, and to really listen, to really understand what, what the position is of each one of those um, entities. So if, if you come in from, like myself, I'll come in from the outside. So often I have to understand both businesses. If you're buying a business and you know your own business very, very well, you'll know what to look for to add into your own business. But the biggest problem we have is the is the flight or the or the fear uh, of existing people within within an entity. Many times they want to know what's going on. Am I have I, do I still have my job? Will I still con continue working the way I am? Will I have the freedom or Will I still be as restricted as I was in the past? There, there are a whole lot of questions. So you're dealing first with the people. And then once you've understood the people and the, and the cultural dynamic of the organization, it's then to look at, at how you can start streamlining and capturing the synergies that you need. So synergies are things like, you know, they might be two accounting systems. How can you use one? Which one is better? You know, you sometimes the one you have, if you're buying a business and you already have one, maybe yours is inferior to the one that you're buying. You might want to adopt that one and vice versa. So there's a whole lot of listening, understanding, first seeing where you can capture those synergies. And then once you've understood all of that, and then it's to start bringing them together. It sounds like a slow process, but often <laughs> the plan is to do it within a hundred days span. So you not only have to do everything patiently and calmly, but you also have to do it at speed, which is conflicting in a, in, in a big way. hundred so, days um, yeah. from, from buying or from the financial integration? hundred days is quite, it's quite sporty. Yeah. Um, so, so from the, from the buying side, so when you, when you're looking at buying a company, the, 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 the one thing is you don't really know the company. So one of the biggest problems that buyers have is that they generally only speak to maybe one or two, three people from the seller. They only get to know only one or two people and they actually don't know the full culture and all the people in the organization. So when, when it comes to the day one, once the, everyone hands over contracts and keys, now for the first time you're being introduced to everyone in the organization. Now as a buyer, from the, from the celebrations of now I've bought a business to, oh, I've bought a business. You know, it's like, oh, there's a surprise. I didn't know this person is over there. This, they, they actually got bigger problems or there's other problems that you never even discussed or even asked the question or didn't even realize these issues. So there's from the buying side, you think you want a particular outcome. And then there's the reality that happens once you're actually starting to work in the trenches. How could you probe that up front? Like, would you walk through, through the rooms there or do interviews with random people? Yeah, there's a there's a there's a special process. So so we call them work streams. So a, a very good way to do it is to is to define what your different work streams are. Um, so it's almost like trying to silo the different departments and areas, or let's call them responsibilities, but at the same time making sure you bring them together. So a work stream could be financial department, sales, marketing. Uh, it could be operations, and if they got a factory or whatever, they that could be a different work stream. Could be production. Could be warehousing. All those could be separate we, uh, work streams. They all have to talk together at the end of the day. But the idea is to understand. What I mean, the before buying. Are. So before buying, if you just before have spoken to three people, as much as much as possible, as much as possible. So you're trying to understand if I buy this business, what's the work stream? Can I get synergies if I plug in what I have into those different work streams? Then you go in with the plan. Mm. If that if that makes sense. So then once you're there, you try to you speak try to... to one person from each work stream at least before you decide least, to buy. Yeah, at least during the due diligence process, you try you try at least at at least uh, individuals there, and you know sometimes they don't share everything that they should. And, and many of them fear their jobs 
when you when you take over so they won't necessarily always be putting you know telling you everything that they they should be right up front so yes to answer your question uh, before you buy you try to break it down into component parts when you do your due diligence uh, when you're doing the actual integration work then you try to interview and then talk to almost everybody that you possibly can unless it's a very large organization but then you try to 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 map out you know who's the players within each work stream what have you experienced recently in in merging that that changed your mind that changed my mind i i i think the the concept of diversity you know um there's there's for for many years we've been talking about minorities and, and and minority groups and diversity bringing diversity into the boardroom bringing diversity into organizations in terms of decision making etc cetera, etc cetera. but diversity uh, has taken on a brand new meaning for me recently um and and it just it was one of those aha moments where we, in the past whenever we were talking about diversity we were thinking about you know, uh, we need minority groups, you know, diff people from different genders, races, uh, ethnic and other groups, that's diversity. That's, that's only a, a small tip of the iceberg. Diversity now in my definition of diversity is about the difference of opinions, the difference of background, the difference of experience and, 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 and other kinds of, uh, let's call it, um, so, uh, for example, yeah, somebody in our community said, hey, I, I came into this business, they bought the business, and then they said, I came into this business, and there were 14 different countries, three different genders, and four different skin colors, but everybody was an engineer. So there was no diversity. I, I would love to have a psychologist and a sociologist and a mathematician and an engineer do you mean the the professions being uh, as as different as possible? Yes, professions, age, age is another thing. I mean, we we often um, underestimate the value that young people can bring to an organization. In other words, the energy and and all that, and we can underestimate the value that older generation can can bring, and also those that 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 have had different life experiences, that had multiple jobs, for instance as opposed to a single career i spoke to someone from a from a, an entity the other day they were they they pretty much from the time they left school they're now in their 50s they stayed at the same organization for all that time and and that is a, an opinion but now you bring someone in from the outside that may have had four or five career changes in their life and what i've even seen in the in the um uh, merger integration industry is that most practitioners have come from multiple industries. So you have people with legal backgrounds that may be criminal or civil or commercial. That's already diverse. And then you have different accounting backgrounds, which could be financial, could be investment banking. It could be, <laughs> and then all of those diversity things. So, so just to, to summarize for me, Diversity in the boardroom and decision making uh, moves away from this. I think what happened with social media to a great extent is that social media has has got these algorithms that get people to be drawn together that are alike. And what you want, if you really want an organization that excels, is you want to have an organization that's com composed of people that are not alike that challenge each other, that actually do a lot more to, to, to broaden the horizon of the organization. So that's the diversity. There's one thing I've learned over the last year or two is, is how important it is to be more diverse in terms of thinking and being challenged in, in, in the way forward because we don't know everything. We think that we do sometimes, but, but uh, actually we need to be challenged and we need to be constantly challenged in this changing world. Where can people learn about successfully merging and integrating? Are there any resources, podcasts, books that you you recommend? So that's that that's a great question. There are few formal um, courses you can go on to. Most of them um, 
are very much at the front end at the merger acquisition part of things. So you can learn how to do deal sourcing and, and uh, due diligence, and you can learn how to do financial modeling and, and all that kind of thing. And, but, and the contracts and the legals, but once a deal has been uh, signed, the actual integration work, uh, there are very few um, sort of formal education courses out there. Um, and the difficulty with that is because it's so diverse. If I'm integrating a SaaS business compared to a large engineering firm, compared to an advertising agency. I've worked with WPP, which is the biggest advertising agency in the world, and they are made up of multiple small businesses. Each one of those different business businesses are, are a culture of their own. So it is just, it, 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 you cannot really write the book on integration per se, but what you can do is you can have frameworks. So what I've, what I've started doing is I've actually started um, a, a, a new podcast myself, which is called 100 Days and Beyond which is uh, from day one, after the, the contracts are signed and the keys are handed over, what happens from that day going forward? And my podcast then will be focused a very, very much on that um, arena. And I'm also in the process in the next 12, 18 months, we'll be publishing all uh, seven books that I've, I've been writing. Uh, I want to quickly give you their titles just so you've got an idea of, of, of uh, the, the kind of, these are more like user guides than, than books. They'll probably be about 250 to 350 pages, but very much user, user guide based in terms of templates and tools. The one is on capital raising, how to raise money, because once you've bought a business, <laughs> the money does run out. You do need to do constant capital raising to keep the, the businesses growing if you want to do further acquisitions. Um, sales acceleration, scientific marketing, all sales and marketing is very key with the growth. Um, doing actual acquisitions and market consolidations because best to often it's best to bring a few businesses together to get to get your growth. Digital transformation, very very important in terms of today's world, going from an online sorry uh, brick and mortar business to an online world. Family office work. So this is the, the problem that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and people have is they build these great businesses and they don't know what to do next. And it's how do you actually create a family office and how do you actually create ongoing wealth for, for future generations? It's not just put it in, as a, as in your testament, will and testament to pass on to your heirs, but how do you build an organization and a be, to have your acquisitions and the and the um, the businesses that you've grown to continue looking after um, generations going to the future, and then there's there's a, a structured business growth uh, a user guide as well. Really love your work though. The stuff that you put out is absolutely brilliant. So um, if there's ever a chance, I'm always recommending your 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 book and 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 your your techniques. I think you've got some really solid stuff. The big thing about once you've done an in, uh, once you start an integration, the big thing is time. You have to quickly get the the, uh, the the company integrated. You know, in other words, bring them together, find the synergies, and then start the growth phase, and then get ready for exit. Because if you're a, if you're in that type of business, you want to grow the business as quick as possible to exit. Most people only make their wealth at exit. You don't necessarily make make a lot of money owning a business. So that's especially for the guys starting businesses now. You almost have to start with a mindset of how do I get out? And you must have a time period for that. Don't sit in a business for 40 years and think you're going to get a ticket, you know, to the Bahamas and with a yacht and and live next to, next to Richard Branson on his island. You got to be thinking about doing multiple exits um, along the way, and that's the right way to do it. So, especially those starting businesses and those that are in business, you always got to be looking at when's the best right. The best time to sell is now. Is I need to start looking how do I exit, and that's part of the whole the whole integration process as well. It's a good idea. It's a good exercise, anyways. Whatever business you're running, even even if it's just you and you're a solopreneur. And you think, hey, it's a lifestyle business. Even in this case, it's a good idea to always have it in a sellable way. Run it as if you wanted to sell it in three years. 
it's just a good exercise. You will organize it better. And the chances are very high that you will organize it in a way that it becomes literally independent of you. And then you can still decide. Like from day one, I run strategy sprints as something that I can sell with a multiple that I like. I'm, I'm not planning on selling it anytime, but I always wanted to have it in a sellable condition, in a sellable state, because otherwise I couldn't even go on holidays if it's not organized in a way that could run without me, right? You spot on there, and I think I think even even in 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 your book and and that is and 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 the material that you put out, I think you talk about can you go on holiday without worrying about your business, and and this is the difference for me about um, being self employed and owning a business, and I think that's really what where the mindset is is going is very very important. If you own a business, it's an it's an entity that should be able to run itself. It's sellable. In other words, I could literally take it there and say, there it is. It's packaged. All the parts, component parts are working well. If you're self-employed, it means that if you stop working, you stop earning. And, and that's always that difference between solopreneur and that scaling up into something that can start running itself. And there's obviously many ways to do that. And you talk a lot about that. But um, yes, that's definitely a concept that should be top of mind, I think, for most business people. I, I will immediately follow your your podcast. Where can we find your podcast? And what's the exact title? Okay, so the exact title is 100daysandbeyond.com. Um, we are busy. Uh, we are busy launching, so we are recording around 25 odd um, recordings with with top. PMI professionals, I mean, really, really top guys, experienced guys that have been around for 15, 20 years plus. They've worked in massive projects in billions of dollars and even smaller uh, business uh, PMI work. Uh, the the uh, recordings and the actual productions will be launched in the next six weeks. Um, so keep an eye out. You'll see there's just a, a template at the moment on 100daysandbeyond.com. And whoever would like to um, uh, to get uh, the first few episodes, absolutely, please get hold of me, uh, and I'll let you know, and I'll put you on our mailing list. It's absolutely free, of course, um, but well worth listening to, especially if you're a an aspiring um, growth uh, business person that really wants to go into something special, uh, which you know, don't have to become a, po a post merger integration practitioner. But whenever you're buying a business, you always got to be thinking further about how do I bring the businesses together to, to get the value creation or the synergies that I'm looking for. So 100daysandbeyond.com is the, is the website and, and, um, and there'll be, um, there'll be uh, podcasts every single week. You'll see them added with starting off with around 25 of them. And it's super relevant thinking growth in terms of growth via acquisitions of either suppliers or competitors directly. Because I think in the next three to 12 months, every one of us will have the chance to buy some competitors at a discount. Because it's, it's recession time in Europe already, probably in the US. They don't call it that way, but it looks like it's the second quarter of negative GDP. So yeah, we are in a recession. And so this is the time where you can buy competitors, where you can buy suppliers. And uh, I'm super excited that we know now Dudley Peacock and his wonderful podcasts and that we can have somebody to, to talk these things through and, and listen to can what I you're share sharing. One, can I share one quick, quick uh, uh, example of, of what's happened with the way the world is going now? As I, I spoke to a guy the other day, he had, he had gone out. He he loves building supplies. He does his building supply. He's got his own little business, building supply business. And he had a friend of his who was also in building supplies and said, look, I really want to get out. I'm tired of it. I just want to get out. And he says, if you take over my business, you know, you can pay me off, take over the business. Then there was another one and there was another one. He eventually got five. He put these five, what he thought was putting them together, all he's do done is bought himself a headache. And he is stressed out of his mind because now he doesn't know how to bring everything together. So my suggestion would be if you are going to go into 
doing any acquisitions, talk to us, uh, you know, uh, the whole um, CEO show and all the stuff that you put out. Honestly, there's brilliant stuff out there. Just think about it first before you buy a business and think about how you're going to integrate and make use of it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's why 100 days, you, you, are, you are amazing if you can do it in 100 days. I've done so many PMIs where after one and a half years, we were still managing the different cultures. And, uh, oh, mamma mia, it's a lot of work. And I'm not even involved in the due diligence in that case. Just, that's just a post-merger integration was so much work but yes it's the time it's the time um right now <laughs> and it is the time. yeah and dudley peacock is the man to speak to and his network of integrators thank you so much dudley where can people find you what's your favorite social media so linkedin is uh is where i'm where i'm at so you, you'll find me on linkedin um dudley peacock uh, I'm, I'm there you'll see uh, my advert for my 100 days and beyond podcast and all the other stuff that that, that i'm busy with uh, and also my website please go onto the website you can uh, we've got multiple courses we've got uh, uh, loads of information there it's called skillful pursuit um and literally it is about the skillful pursuit, the pursuit of skills, the pursuit of getting better. Um, I think as business people, we know that we don't know everything. And I think the, the, the goal is, is to be in this continuous pursuit of, of excellence, of being world-class in whatever career or um, uh, uh, let's call it te technical or sales or marketing skills that you've got involved in just to be world-class and the best you can be. So that's really what we're trying to do with Skillful Pursuit, skillfulpursuit.com. Uh, come to LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn a lot. Uh, and I've got a, a, a Facebook group as well, which you can welcome to join where we interact as well. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Dudley, for sharing your wisdom, your journey with us. Keep rolling, man. Yeah, thank you so much. And keep you keep up the good work. I love your stuff. Hey, if you love what you are hearing, you will love our free masterclasses. Go grab them at strategiesprints.com. What if your business would run well even when you are on vacation? Discover how 1,600 business owners have regained their freedom using the Strategy Sprints blueprints. How they enjoy living their dream and watching their business scale. Get the exact checklists they use to go from stressed to fulfilled using the Strategy Sprints method. Order your copy of Strategy Sprints 12 Ways to Accelerate Growth for an Agile Business on Amazon today. And if you love it, leave us a review. For more information, head over to strategiesprints.com.